This mountain range in the west of Austria marks a border of sorts. Looking east, the icy peaks of Tyrol spread to the horizon. To the west lies the province of Vorarlberg, once part of another continent. The rivers of this mountain send their waters to oceans far apart, the Black Sea and the North Sea. Up here, land cultivated for centuries borders on raw wilderness. Today, visitors from many countries mix on the Arlberg's powdery slopes. But for the locals, the Arlberg has been a border between contrasting ancient dialects since tribal days. Even the menus in the ski chalets reflect two different cooking cultures, or just as often call the same dish by different names. However, in a quiet way, the people east and west of the Arlberg still have a lot in common. A joint appreciation of the hidden beauties of their land. A knowledge that the Arlberg is really a hidden paradise. Arlberg? Actually, there isn't any particular peak or crest or rock formation of that name. The term Arlberg Pass is a modern invention. The region thus named could be defined by its major villages St. Anton, St. Christoph, Stuben, Zuers, and Lech. These used to be remote mountain villages, romantically picturesque, but of little importance. But in the early 20th century came a dramatic change. The rich and the beautiful discovered this stunning mountain scenery as a perfect winter playground. The impact of tourism first transformed the eastern slopes, the Tyrolean side. The west, for Alberg, soon followed suit. The little village of Lech turned into an elegant ski resort. It all began in 1901 with the foundation of the Arlberg Ski Club. Twenty years later, the region's first skiing school was founded, making the Arlberg the cradle of alpine skiing. Whether it was laced boots and leather strap bindings, or whether it's high-tech gear, the enthusiasm for skiing has been boundless ever since. But it's not just two-legged creatures on one or two boards who occupy these slopes. 
just over the next ridge from the ski runs, hardly a stone's throw away from the sporting crowds, the wild inhabitants of the mountains are spending the winter. Sheer rocks are not for skiers. They're the domain of chamois and ibex. In the height of winter, the mothers and their young seek out windswept mountaintops where the vegetation lies bare. In this season, the bucks come to join the flocks of females. The males have a strict and simple hierarchy. The big ones with the big horns dominate the smaller ones. Such sparring among the bucks isn't serious. Their hierarchy has been established long ago, back in summer. If the temperament of two young bucks should ever get out of hand, an older male would quickly intervene. In the cold weather, with sparse food resources, the entire herd would suffer if the males wasted their energy with infighting. Ibex are really a peaceful lot. In terms of climate and weather, the Alberg is in an exposed position. Every storm front arriving from the Atlantic is stopped by this barrier. The clouds pile up and drop enormous loads of snow. Eurasian siskin spend the cold months in large flocks. Along the timber line they find tree seeds all winter long. Red deer herds prefer sheltered valleys to escape the onslaught of snow. In the western valleys, the average annual snow cover is seven to even eight meters. Up in St. Anton, it's about half of that. And in the higher valleys, the annual average is an incredible 14 meters. On the lee side of the ridges is where the snow really piles up. For the chamois, cutting across such slopes is not just tedious. They're risking their lives. Cautiously, an experienced female makes a track. The younger members of the flock follow, always mindful to keep the number of individuals in the danger zone to a minimum. The mother with the smallest kids goes last. Often the chamois have to enter risky slopes to get to their grazing. In the old days, mountain farmers took the same risk to get hay for their livestock. It's the snow that enables the farmers to get the hay on which their livestock depends. Unter Lebensgefahr fährt man die kostbare Last auf Tannenreisig zu Tal. On fir tree branches, the precious load slides downhill.
On level ground, the hay is packed on sleds and pulled to the village. Werden die Touren auf Kufen umgeladen und in das Dorf gezogen. Lifestyles may have changed since then. The wind hasn't. When storm gusts whirl up the snow, they pulverize the brittle snow crystals. The wind blows the snow over long distances, creating a new landscape. This snow has three times the weight of fresh powder and builds huge precarious drifts along the ridges. Often, a slight trigger is enough to send tons and tons of snow thundering downhill. People of the Arlberg have always had to live with the forces of nature. Since the late 19th century, structures like this gallery have offered protection against avalanches, but such measures have often proved insufficient. In the valleys too, Masses of snow have always posed a challenge. In the past, elbow grease was the only remedy. Later, heavy machinery did the job. Back in the mountains above the village of Lech, there's a strange landscape feature, fully revealed only from the air. Like discarded egg cartons, some 1,000 craters dot the surface. The biggest of these dolines is 100 meters across and 35 meters deep. It was created by a special form of erosion. Water made the gypsum in the rock expand. The surrounding rock crumbled and was eventually washed away by the rain. In the winter, this landscape with its many edges and craters and its labyrinth of snow-covered Swiss mountain pines is a perfect hideaway for wildlife. It's a permanent haunt of Potomacans, together with chamois. They find food in places where small avalanches have exposed the ground. Avalanches, in other words, not only bring destruction and death, but also opportunities. Without them, the snow blanket would cut off the animals from food for many months. Potomacans can make do with very little, digesting even small, tough branches and getting the maximum energy from their frugal diet.
overnight and around midday, the birds buried themselves in the deep snow to escape the wind. Winter in the mountains can be tough indeed, but when it's really cold and the air is clear, the frosty season displays its full glory. Fresh snow has covered the heights, sending the chamois downhill to sheltered places. Days are getting longer and the sun is gaining in strength, quickly loosening winter's grip. trickle and murmur of water is everywhere. Water and warmth bring to light the first messengers of spring. Snowbells shoot from the thawing ground. These flowers are perfectly adapted to the extreme conditions up here, and beneath the snow, something is moving. The marmots have awoken from hibernation. For more than six months they slept in their burrows, depending on their fat reserves. Now it's time for a hearty breakfast. From its hide, a ptarmigan is watching. Further down the slope, a black grouse male on a lek is trying to attract females. Any intruder on the lek will be confronted. The intruder seems to respect his rival's superior strength. It's mid-June. Spring arrives late up here. But now, on clear days, the sun is powerful and quickly melts the last remnants of snow and ice. Small rivulets now turn into powerful torrents. Color is returning to the banks. Alpen roses, cranes bills, and pasque flowers line the mountain streams. But what about the many ski runs? For 70 years, tens of thousands of skiers have been compacting the snow, and for 35 years, more and more artificial snow has been added. The answer is surprising. 
Above the village of Lech, ski runs have turned into a sea of flowers. Just recently, botanists have counted more than 30 plant species per square meter, including rare protected plants like broad-leafed marsh orchid and the globe flower. All these flowers profit from regular mowing and grazing. In the shade of the forest edge, a rare botanical gem is found, the yellow lady slipper. Its flower is surrounded by a so-called bract. To get to the nectar, insects squeeze into the bract and can leave it only through one opening. Since dead insects are often found beneath such plants, it was believed that the lady's slipper is a carnivorous plant. In fact, however, predatory spiders often lie in wait by the bract's exit, killing the insects and leaving their empty skins in the grass. In late spring, after the snow melt, one of the sources of the Lech River is in spate. Crystal clear water gushes from limestone rocks and soon the creek grows into a small river. The Lech River has carved a deep canyon into the limestone. This is Europe's great continental divide. From here, the Lech, Rosanna and Mustal rivers flow towards the Black Sea, while the Flexen, Routes and Bregenz rivers end up in the North Sea. Along the ridges and crests of the Arlberg, it's decided whether a falling raindrop is sent on a long journey east or north. Before the roosters crow and the wind chases the last wafts of fog out of the valleys and over the crests, the herdsman leads his herd to pasture. These paths are rough, the cattle have to climb over loose debris. Just setting one foot before the other can be a chore, and he goes on and on to a height of 2,000 meters. The mountain spring is as refreshing as the clear air up here. Mountain pastures are still being cultivated to this day. The grazing keeps bushes and trees down and the meadows clear. After the high pastures have been grazed, blue flowers begin to dot the slopes. It's the blue wolf's bane, one of Central Europe's most toxic plants. According to a Greek myth, it grew from a hellhound's drivel. The mere touch of the blue or the yellow wolf's bane can cause severe toxic shock. The animals seem to be aware of the risk and keep away from it. Mountain cabins have always been built in spots known to be safe from avalanches. Some of them used to be dairy farms. For centuries, traditional cheese making was practiced up here. This is tedious work. Fresh morning milk and milk from the previous evening are mixed with ferment and heated. The curdled mass is cut up with a cheese blade.
Then the mass is heated again and stirred for several hours. In the days when the pastures could not be reached by vehicles, making cheese was the only way of preserving the summer milk. The job isn't finished yet. The soft cheese is packed into cloth, pressed and turned over again and again. is drained off. Once a loaf has the right consistency, it's immersed in salt water overnight. Regular turning and rubbing with salt water produces a nice rind. After four months, the cheese is mature, but its typical aroma will still take a while to develop. The Alberg's deep past is full of surprises. Some 220 million years ago, its crests were flat, tropical beaches, not far from the equator. Again and again, the tropical sun dried out shallow lagoons, leaving behind gypsum. As the African plate drifted northward and eventually collided with Europe, the shallow sea and its beaches were squeezed together and eventually lifted up. The gypsum craters, as such, may be unspectacular, but they allow trees to grow way above the timber line. Along the crater rims, the air is warm. Cold air drains away into the funnels, turning the climate upside down. For the marmots, the sunny slopes of these craters are paradise. It's full of hiding places, and the soft ground is easy to dig. The young are out all day now, trying to gain weight. They have to hurry up. Summer is short in the mountains. To make it through their first winter, they'll need lots of fat. Now that food is plentiful, the marmots can afford to stay close to their tunnels, in case a golden eagle should suddenly appear out of the blue. Eating isn't everything. There also must be time for social life. All work and no play makes a dull marmot. Marmots are natural-born whistleblowers. If one of them spots anything suspicious, it will sound an ear-rending alarm. Higher up, a herd of chamois mothers and their kids have gathered. Here too, good, clean fun seems to be an important part of life. For the little ones, these are vital exercises to prepare them for life in a steep world.
in the mountains weather changes can be spontaneous. If the wind turns to a northerly or northeasterly, the Alberg is in for a storm. When early settlers found such shapes imprinted in the rocks, they called them thunderbolts, believing they had been engraved by flashes of lightning. For the mysterious tracks next to them, they also had a ready explanation. This is where the devil danced. But there are more factual explanations. The thunderbolts are really remnants of early relatives of modern octopus, and the devil's footprints are seashells from an ancient reef. 200 million years ago, this was a seafloor. The Thetis, the ancient Mediterranean with its sprawling lagoons, kept changing its shape and size again and again. To the expert, this is an open book telling 400 million years of geological history. Broken up by ice and washed out by water and acids, this karst landscape is the result of erosion. And there are even more witnesses of lost eras. The ancient sea was populated by ammonites, marine predators like the nautilids, the predecessors of modern octopus. These rock formations with their peculiar surface texture are remnants of corals that lived here some 200 million years ago. Over millions of years, the sea level rose and fell, followed by the growth and decay of coral reefs. The limestone skeletons of these tiny animals will gradually build up massive reefs. But the Alberg's coral gardens were just a brief episode in Europe's long history. In fact, these rocks have come from several ancient continents. Opposite the so-called Sea of Stone, there's another reminder of long lost days. The Red Face. The red face's structure is simple and clear, without complex folds and faults, yet its history is fascinating. The layers at the base consist of the oldest rocks. A vertical climb up the red face is a time journey through more than 100 million years. The red band which inspired the wall's name dates from the era of dinosaurs. Back then, this layer was several hundred meters below the sea. There were strong currents. The iron contained in the sediment reacted with the oxygen in the seawater, dyeing the rock red. On the eastern side, in Tyrol, the rocks have an even longer story to tell. The climber's hands are touching the recycled rock of a mountain range that was eroded more than 300 million years ago. Masses of this debris sank down into the Earth's mantle, was transformed by pressure and heat, and lifted up again. The rocks where ibex are resting today are echoes of ancient continents. The history of the ibex may be much more recent. 
but it's just as dramatic. In the Middle Ages, these animals inspired a mystic imagination. They were believed to have magical powers. Almost all parts of their bodies were used as medicines. By the early 19th century, the ibex was practically extinct. Only in the Gran Paradiso Mountains in Italy, some 60 individuals survived. Under the personal protection of the Italian king, the population was allowed to recover somewhat. But when Swiss authorities asked for some animals to rebuild a Swiss population, the king declined. Switzerland then sent a group of poachers to kidnap some ibex. Their offspring now numbers 30,000 individuals in the Alps. Snowfall is likely at any season on the Arlberg, even in the height of summer. The famous Edelweiss has no problem with a few days of winter in the middle of summer. Its fur is a protection against ice and snow, dry winds and ultraviolet radiation. But snow in summer will not last long. As the fog lifts, it becomes clear that this time the blizzard was not so heavy. The cattle is unimpressed. The horses too seem to be used to this. A few centimeters of snow in summer cannot belie a general trend in the Alps. The climate is warming and the glaciers are waning. In recent decades, the Kaltenberg Glacier has lost much of its ice mass. The same is true for the Kuchen Glacier. Some 20, 30 years ago, this vast field of debris was still covered by ice. Over the past 25 years, many alpine glaciers have lost almost a third of their volume. The end of this trend is not in sight. Down on the pastures, the cattle have eaten almost all the grass, leaving only a few big plants like the yellow gentian. Yellow gentian can grow very old, up to 70 years. Its taste is extremely bitter and it has always been regarded as a medical plant. On the mountain meadows around the former village of Bursteg, it's now time for haymaking. In the olden days, this was done with scythes and rakes. Since the men used to be in the military working abroad, this hard work was left to the women folk. The women even pulled the hay to the shacks or all the way down to the valleys. There are years when summer seems endless, but then the first night frost transforms the landscape overnight. Fogs roll through the valleys and the breeze carries an autumn fragrance. bright yellow of the woodland contrasts the deep blue of the sky, accentuated by the neon red of rowan berries. In fact, these are not berries at all, but apple-like fruits of the rose family. 
which is of little concern to the red deer. To them, it's just a juicy snack. Before the winter, anything that's nourishing is welcome. The fruit of the rowan tree contains lots of sugar. For centuries, these fruit were believed to be poisonous. In fact, however, even humans can eat them when they're cooked. They contain lots of vitamin C. Not only ungulates like red and roe deer appreciate these red fruits. Badgers, foxes and numerous other species love them too. Rowan trees grow along small streams as well as the timberline. Most of the trees are high, too high to reach for most animals. No problem for birds. About 60 bird species feed on them. This is how autumn sounds in the mountains. All day long, the rotting calls of stags echoes from the slopes. The roar is more than just a threat to male rivals. From a male's voice, females can discern the strength and health of a stag. The deeper the voice, the greater the attraction. If a young male should intend to approach the harem of a dominant stag, a battle is inevitable. can last several weeks. For the dominant stags, this is the most stressful time of the year. loser has to go. If he survives the winter, he can have another try next year. Now that the trees are in full color, it's time for a special harvest. For decades, this gentian plant has withstood all sorts of troubles. Now, it will serve a noble cause. This is the stuff the legendary gentian schnapps is made of. Roots of the yellow gentian. Not the blue variety as so many tags on stylish bottles suggest. The roots are cleaned with a brush, very carefully. Even the slightest remnant of dirt would spoil the work of many days. The clean roots are chopped up. They are soaked in warm water together with some yeast.
After three weeks of fermentation, the mash is ready. It is poured into a retort pot. The so-called bird's beak is placed on top. It requires experience to keep the temperature just right. Just at the right moment, the still has to be cooled down. Gentian schnapps is distilled twice. Only then is it fit for consumption. In the Alps, any alcoholic beverage is regarded as medicine. In folk medicine, even the product of the first distilling is used as an ointment. The end product, the schnapps, is recommended after physical exertion or general weakness and after a good meal. Tagesarbeit, Abendsgäste. Bacon dumplings after a day of hard work. Who could resist? In the evening, a farmer would invite all of his farmhands for dinner. And dinner is rounded off with a glass of gentian schnapps. November. The first snow in the mountains signals the opening of an exciting spectacle. The chamois rut. In contrast to the ibex, who will batter each other with sheer power, chamois bucks will engage each other in breakneck chases. The stage is the roughest of terrains. full circle. The chamois have done what is necessary to multiply in spring. Again, the Alberg is gradually being buried in masses of snow. The animals are withdrawn to quiet valleys and rocky crags, and soon the crowds of two-legged winter guests will be back. 